American sports, it's fairly common for a team to relocate. The Washington Senators became the Texas Rangers in 1972. Seven years later, the New Orleans Jazz moved to Utah, where there isn't that much jazz. And the Raiders moved to Oakland, then to LA, then back to Oakland, and then on to Vegas. And to quote basketball, no one seemed to notice. Thank you, basketball. Relocation has even happened in MLS when the San Jose Earthquakes up sticks to become the Houston Dynamo in 2006. One of the many ways that US sports is unique is that teams are often referred to as a franchise. It positions them as a business commodity, the plaything of a rich owner, rather than the pillar upon which a community is based. The relocation of teams as franchises, it sucks, but it's accepted as something that happens in the US. But it's quite unthinkable for a team to leave its city and rebrand somewhere like the UK. It never happens. Well, it did happen once, and it happened to my team. My name is Ryan Bailey, and in this episode of Soccer 101, I'll be explaining the history of Wimbledon FC, now AFC Wimbledon, and the exceptionally controversial uprooting of the team that happened in the early part of this millennium. Wimbledon FC were founded 132 years ago on Wimbledon Common, a stone's throw from the Fox and Grapes pub that was used as their changing room. In 1912, the team moved to Plough Lane, a ground situated about one and a half miles from the All England Lawn Tennis Club, where the championships are held every year. But Plough Lane was a little less decadent and could hold a little over 15,000 people, which is roughly the same capacity as centre court at the tennis club these days. Wimbledon have always been an underdog who stood in the shadow of nearby teams including Chelsea, Crystal Palace and Fulham. And they didn't become a league team, a professional league team, until 1977. From then, the tiny club went through an improbable rise through the football pyramid and were promoted to the first division, the equivalent of the Premier League back in the day, in 1986. Wimbledon made it to the top flight after only nine years of being a professional league club and just four years after being in the fourth division. That's the equivalent of a League Two team like, say, Crawley or Forest Green Rovers getting into the Premier League in four years' time. Most expected Wimbledon to flop in the top flight, but we stayed up there for 14 seasons. The team's high point came two seasons after reaching the top flight when we got to the 1988 FA Cup final to face Liverpool. Liverpool then were by far the best team in Europe and no one gave the tiny team from South London a hope in heck of getting anything other than a hiding in that FA Cup final. The players themselves spent the night before the game getting drunk at the aforementioned Fox and Grapes pub on Wimbledon Common with the cash for the drinks coming from the manager, Bobby Gould. But on May 14th, 1988, Wimbledon produced one of the biggest shocks in soccer history by beating European powerhouse Liverpool 1-0 and denying them their second domestic double in three seasons. Until Leicester City won the Premier League in 2016, this was typically viewed as one of the most surprising results to ever happen in the sport. Over the years, the team developed a reputation for outkicking their coverage. We were the scrappy underdog that no one wanted to face on a cold winter afternoon. My Wimbledon story started a few years later in 1994, when my dad started taking me to games. Three years earlier, the team had been forced to leave their Plough Lane home as it was deemed it couldn't be upgraded to an all-seater stadium in line with rules put in place for top flight teams following the Hillsborough disaster. So Wimbledon made a move a few miles east to Selhurst Park, home of Crystal Palace, and it had been home to Charlton previously, they'd been lodgers there, and more recently, Ted Lasso's AFC Richmond have played there too. I vividly remember my first match, a 2-1 victory against the aforementioned Leicester in September 1994. I remember the smell of the creaky wooden seats at Selhurst, which have long since been replaced. The older men in sheepskin coats placing bets on the outcome in the stadium bar. The glossy match day souvenir programme, which featured future Hollywood star and Wimbledon hard man midfielder Vinnie Jones on its cover. The team back then were affectionately known as the Crazy Gang, due to the overtly physical antics of Jones and his pals, and the manner in which they gained the edge on more celebrated opposition through psychology and intimidation. Wimbledon's uncanny ability to play on the same field as the Manchester United and Liverpools of this world made us everybody's second favourite team. In sports, there's nothing quite like the rise of an underdog. But the unbridled joy I felt being an underdog was soon to be overshadowed by the tragic death of my club. 
During Wimbledon's tenancy at Selhurst Park, the eccentric owner of the club, Sam Hammam, explored some options for a new home, none of which, incidentally, were in Wimbledon. Some of the radical solutions included moves to Cardiff and Dublin, which are cities located in entirely different countries. The latter move came within inches of actually happening in the mid-90s, as detailed in Jack Pitt Brooks' article, How Wimbledon Very Nearly Moved to Dublin on The Athletic. I recommend you go check that out. These wild suggestions were poo-pooed and protested by fans and the English Football Association, who at that point wouldn't entertain the notion of moving a club away from its home, let alone to a different country. In 1997, the club was sold to a pair of successful Norwegian businessmen, Kjellins Rocker and Bjorn Rune Gjelsten, who had tried and failed to buy Chelsea before settling on the smaller team a few miles down the street. The Norwegians had invested heavily and successfully in their hometown team, Molde, which you may know from its association with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. But the Norwegians' intentions to guide Wimbledon back to their spiritual home proved to be insincere. Before I carry on with the story and the team's move to Milton Keynes to become Franchise FC, I'd like to remind you about Stereo and our show on the Stereo app. In case you haven't checked it out, the Stereo app has thousands of live social conversations with a wide range of genres for every interest, including news, comedy, sports, and more. You choose whether to be a co-host, participate as a guest, or simply listen in on these exclusive conversations. Every Thursday evening, the Soccer 101 and Total Soccer Show gang are on stereo, which you download on your phone, by the way, iOS or Android. And on there, we shoot the breeze, answer your questions, and discuss Soccer 101 topics. It's really, really good fun. After you download the stereo app, you can find my profile on there, at Ryan Bailey. Taylor is at Rockwell TSS, and Joe is at Joe Lowry. Follow us and check out our Thursday shows. They're a lot of fun, and it helps us keep bringing you great soccer content if you support us on there. Thank you very much. Go check out Stereo. All right. In August 2001, the club announced its intention to leave London to move to the town of Milton Keynes, which was 56 miles north of London. That doesn't sound like a lot. You might drive that far for a stake in this country. But in England, where there are literally dozens of teams located within that 56 mile radius, it's a huge move. The threat of a move had been wielded over our team before, but this one felt a bit more tangible. We knew we would fight it, but the announcement felt like a swift punch to the gut. Founded in 1967, making it a baby in comparison to most UK towns, Milton Keynes boasted all the infrastructure and amenities of a modern conurbation, but lacked one thing that most other urban environments in the UK had, a professional soccer team. So rather than invest and cultivate in an amateur team of their own, like most English and European communities have always done, a Milton Keynes business consortium intended to poach a pre-made package from somewhere else. In the 1980s, they came close to stealing away Luton Town and also discussed the possibility of stealing London clubs Barnet, Crystal Palace and Queen's Park Rangers. But Wimbledon, with a relatively small fan base, few financial means and no home of their own to speak of, were a perfect target for the kidnapping. Wimbledon fans and their sympathetic rivals vehemently opposed the idea, as did the English Football League, the English Football Association, and even a 150-man parliamentary committee. Yes, this issue went all the way to the Houses of Parliament. Attending games while this controversy raged was a pretty miserable experience, I have to be honest. What was once a joyous afternoon with my dad and brother turned into a bitter and futile exercise in protest. For the duration of most games, a horrible negative atmosphere engulfed Selhurst Park as profane chants were directed at the owners. Protest banners that read, A club is for life, not just for profit, and MK No Way were unfurled and the hateful resonance in the air didn't exactly provide the encouragement that our team needed. Going to watch a team we loved just wasn't fun anymore. After months of hostility and gut-wrenching protests that carried a feeling of inevitability, the sucker punch finally came. In May 2002, after multiple legal battles between the club, the fans and the soccer authorities, the decision was ultimately handed to a three-person independent arbitration panel. Even at that point, no one in soccer really thought we would lose this case. But against all expectation, that panel voted two to one in favour of the move. With the promise of a lucrative stadium, a hotel and a shopping complex, my team had been lured away from the people who created it and rebranded as the Milton Keynes Dons. 
The independent panel's judgment came at the same time, by the way, as David Beckham broke a metatarsal bone in his foot, threatening his appearance at the 2002 World Cup. So the news was kind of buried. And so was Wimbledon FC. My dad had attended games since the 1960s and witnessed plenty of defeats in his time, but he'd never suffered a loss quite like this, losing the whole team. I felt pained by the situation, but he was truly devastated. He didn't burn his jerseys or chain himself to the stadium gates. He simply refused to talk about it and completely lost his vigor for the game. He retreated into himself. It was, it was heartbreaking to watch. Our team, the focal point of our community, had been moved away for the sake of a commercial property deal, essentially. For weeks, that nauseating feeling at the pit of my stomach was kind of like that split-second feeling you have when you think you might slip off the top of a tall ladder. The idea of following the team north and watching them have their name, their colours and badge changed was completely unconscionable. It was a dark time and for a while, I have to admit, I also fell out of love with the sport entirely. But rather than wallowing in our collective misery, Wimbledon fans quickly converted heartache into action. Before long, a phoenix rose from the ashes. Now I'm going to quickly jump in here one more time to let you know about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. You know what's not fair? Yeah, your team being moved to Milton Keynes. But also what's not fair is the fact that Netflix hides thousands of shows and movies from you based on your location and then has the nerve to increase their prices on you. That's right, they've just raised their prices once again. Now you could just cancel your subscription in protest or you could be smart about it and make sure you're getting your full money's worth by using ExpressVPN, much like this guy does. ExpressVPN also allows you to explore streaming catalogs from your providers that are not available in your region. If you put in your IP address to make it the UK, you can see all the streaming options available in the UK. And I often use it to watch BBC iPlayer, which is only available in the UK and is a lovely taste of home. ExpressVPN is also super fast and works on your phone, your laptop, even your smart TV, so you can watch shows on the big screen with zero buffering. I've used a lot of VPN services in my day, and in my experience, ExpressVPN is the easiest to use, and most importantly, the most reliable. And we have an offer for Soccer 101 listeners. Go to expressvpn.com slash soccer to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free on a one-year package. And that goes for everybody, domestic and international listeners, expressvpn.com slash soccer for three months free. Expressvpn.com slash soccer for three months free. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's show. Now back to the story. In the immediate aftermath of the decision to move the team, a group of Wimbledon fans met at the Fox and Grapes pub on Wimbledon Common. Yes, that same location where the original schoolboy team would get changed and where the 1988 heroes had that pre-gaming session before the FA Cup final. With no right to appeal, the fans in the pub agreed that night that the only course of action was to start a brand new club from scratch. Exactly two days after the announcement of the move, the Wimbledon Independent Supporters Association held a formal meeting where they agreed to do it, to start from scratch once again. And just like that, AFC Wimbledon was born by a bunch of guys in a bar who had never run anything close to a soccer team before. The team and the league place may have been sold off to the highest bidder, but the soul of this team would remain very much in place, resurrected through the power of its community. We were turning a massive loss into a big win. Fundraising began immediately. A modest stadium site was located in Kingston, a few miles away from Wimbledon. A new jersey and badge were designed and public tryouts were held for new players in a park. And over 230 amateurs of varying quality showed up to try out for the new team. A trust was set up with Covenant stipulating that 75% of ownership of the team would always, always belong to fans. My dad, my brother and I all became part owners of this brand new team. We were issued shares that we'll never sell and which would never offer us a dividend. All of this laborious and bureaucratic work was done in a matter of weeks by volunteer fans with no experience of league administration, sponsorship deals or scouting for talent. But we held a belief in the powerful community spirit that sports can summon. We knew that working to build something we could call our own would be far more rewarding than following a Premier League team with more concern for its stock price than the proles who dutifully buy their overpriced tickets and their merch. We'd witnessed a tiny team rise from the very bottom to the very top against all odds before, and we believed we could make it happen again. And you know what? It did happen again. 
AFC Wimbledon played their first match in 2002. It was a 4-0 loss for the team of players wearing borrowed uniforms who barely knew each other's names, but it was the start of something very, very special. This team started out in the amateur ninth tier of the pyramid and took just nine seasons to earn five promotions to reach the Professional Football League. Yes, that's nine seasons to get into the professional leagues on a tiny budget, exactly like the old Wimbledon. To put the icing on the cake, the ailing Milton Keynes Dons were relegated to the fourth tier in 2018, while the Phoenix Club that started in protest of their existence played in League One, the league above them. The team now known and derided as Franchise FC had failed. The Phoenix Club that chose community over profit had risen and succeeded. Wimbledon are admired in English soccer for making a success of the fan-owned model, while Milton Keynes are still boycotted by many away fans. As for the rivalry between the two teams, well, some Wimbledon fans indulge in it, but I won't. I've never seen MK Dons play live, and I never will. I won't go to the stadium, I won't acknowledge them as a legitimate entity. I don't really wish ill on any soccer fans out there, but the ethical and moral hoops that must be jumped through to be a supporter of that team, I find quite troubling. AFC Wimbledon also set a successful benchmark for the rise of other Phoenix fan-owned teams. FC United of Manchester was started by disaffected Man United fans in 2005. Wickham Wanderers and Portsmouth were both fan-owned for a period of time. And teams like Exeter City were bought out by fan trusts. And now, if you'll indulge me, I have a personal story about my team and the inextricable way they're linked to my life and my family. In September 2015, my dad watched in delight as the new iteration of his favourite team came back from 1-0 down to beat Notts County 2-1. The winning goal that day came with seconds to spare in the 90th minute, courtesy of striker Adebayo Akinfenwa, the beast, who you may have seen or may have attempted to steer in the FIFA video games at some point. Shortly after that game, no doubt in a jubilant mood from the clutch win, my dad sent me an email to confirm our plan for me to fly home and attend the next home game as a family, along with my brother, just as we'd done <clears throat> throughout our youth. I was tinged with the same excitement I would get um, sitting in the back of his car to ride to the stadium as a boy. I hit reply on his email. I wrote a note back. I'm looking forward to it, I said. It was a, it was a cheerful sign-off. My dad never received that email. We're given comfort by the fact that one of the last things he did on this earth was to see his team win in emphatic fashion. He was a quiet man with no discernible pastimes or interest outside of his family or his football club. He loved both dearly and it's pleasing to know he had both on his mind in the hours before a very sudden heart attack took him away from us at a young age. Some months after his passing at an end of season celebration event, my brother had the opportunity to meet Akin Fenwa. He explained my dad's lifelong support of the club and how happy he was in his final moments thanks to the last gasp goal that Akin Fenwa had scored. My brother thanked him for bringing our dad so much joy in his final few hours. The imposing 224 pound striker couldn't help but show his emotion at that point as he listened intently to my brother's story. He said to him, stories like this are why I joined a family club like this. Uh, that's what Akin Fenwa said as my brother uh, gave him a hug and uh, Akin Fenwa wiped a tear from his eye, if you could believe that. We were told for decades that a move back to Wimbledon would be impossible. The old Plough Lane site had long been sold to a supermarket chain who then sold it to a developer who built apartments there. But as we'd done so many times in our past, we made the impossible happen. In 2018, construction began on our brand new stadium located on the same street, Plough Lane, around 200 yards from the old stadium on the site of a dog racetrack that had closed. Using crowdsource funding and ensuring majority fan ownership, enough funds were raised to complete the project. AFC Wimbledon played their first ever game at New Plough Lane a few months ago on November 3rd, 2020. No fans were allowed to attend, but the team is safely back in the community where it belongs. My brother and I both helped fund that stadium and soon my dad's name will be inscribed on a wall with the rest of the club's founding members. For playing his part in supporting this club for his entire life and emboldening this community, my dad's spirit lives on through this team. Many folks pick the team they follow arbitrarily. They might like a player on the team or they might want to pick a winner or they are geographically inclined to support their hometown team. My team was passed to me through my dad and I feel blessed to have had such an active involvement in a team as an owner, as a, as a stakeholder in its 
future too. We might never win the Champions League and we might have a rocky future as the fan-owned model struggles to compete in the financial pressure cooker of modern soccer. But that doesn't matter. This team will forever be in my blood and I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you very much for listening, except if you're an NK Dons fan, in which case I retract my thank you. And thank you very much to Stereo, who are hosting our Thursday live shows on their iOS and Android app. Stereo is the app for live social conversations, and we want to talk directly with you, our listeners. You can join our show, ask questions about anything soccer-related. I'd love to talk to you about this Wimbledon story, for example. And you can share your experiences and opinions with us. We want to hear everything. Download now and join us live this week. There's a link to our show in the description. Thanks for listening and come on you dons.